Hello. Welcome to the Weave online user group. Hopefully you can hear and see me. My name is Tom O'Nara. I run our developer experience team here at Weaveworks. We are very lucky here today to have um, our guest speaker, Sandeep Dinesh from Google, who will be talking about Kubernetes best practices and also one of our engineers, Jordan Pelletsari, who will also be talking about our own lessons learned because we are a, also a Kubernetes shop here at Weaveworks. Um, before that, a quick word from our sponsor, Weaveworks, um, which is a company that Jordan and I work at. Um, if you haven't heard of us, um, our CEO and CTO, as, as well as a few engineers, are from the people who brought you RabbitMQ, both the technology and the company. We are also a Google Ventures startup with offices headquartered in London, in San Francisco, Berlin, as well as engineers around the world. Uh, our primary product is Weave Cloud, and here's just a quick screenshot um, where it helps you to do a variety of things such as um, cluster management through monitoring and other things such as automated deployment and also helping to network your clusters. And a quick second video. So um, our uh, product does a variety of things, but here are just some teasers on how you can visualize uh, using our um, visualization tool uh, into your cluster, your pods, and what's even awesome is we have this great feature where you can um, go right into uh, your, um, using a CLI tool go, tool, go right into this terminal view so you don't have to worry about SSHing in. So there are many, many more things that we have there, but that's just one of our shiny items that I thought I would share. And so with that, if you want to find out more information, we are at weave.works. And if you also look at slash help, that's how you'll reach um, the developer experience team through our Slack channel or through help emails. We have a variety of ways to get in touch. So today, like I said, we're very lucky to have Sandeep and Jordan. So with that, we thank you again for coming. And I will switch it over. We see Sandeep there. Great. So Sandeep, you want to share your screen? Yeah, let's get started. OK, awesome. So hey, guys. I uh, hope you all are doing well this Tuesday morning. Uh, my name is Sandeep. I'm a developer advocate uh, from Google Cloud. And today I want to talk to you kind of about these Kubernetes best practices and just some background on how this came about. Basically. You know, I was talking to different people on my team, and everyone says, no, the best way to do this is that, and the best way to do this is that. And I said, hey, let's just take all of these things that we know is the best way to do stuff, and then, you know, put it into a document. And so we started doing all of this, and we started getting more and more ideas around the best ways of managing your containers, deploying your to production, things like that. And pretty soon, we had, you know, a giant list of stuff. So I took all that and kind of distilled it down into this talk. And the reason why this whole came about is because Kubernetes is really flexible. Uh, it was designed to let you do kind of whatever you want. Uh, it gives you a bunch of primitives that you can, you know, kind of Lego connect them together and create a system that fits what you need. But the problem with that is you might shoot yourself in the foot, right? Uh, it doesn't really prevent you from just destroying yourself. Um, Unlike a traditional PaaS, where you had to follow very strict rules, uh, Kubernetes kind of lets you do whatever you want. It's more an, in the line of, you know, here's your sandbox, go play with it, but you don't choke on the sand. <laughs> so basically, I have a bunch of different sections around, you know, building containers all the way to deploying and some best practices that we've found. So I'm going to start from the start, which is building containers. So number one, don't trust arbitrary base images. I see people doing this all the time. Basically, they find a base image on Docker Hub that some random person created. Uh, maybe it has some package that you need, and they just arbitrarily use it in production. Well, it's possible that it's using old versions of code that have exploits. It's possible that it has a bug in it. It's possible that you know uh, it could have malware bundled in on purpose. You never know. And so one thing you can do is try to run some sort of static analysis of containers. So CoreOS has Clare. There's a lot of these open source ones available. And what these do is they basically scan your container and look for known vulnerabilities, right? So let's say it's using an old version of Node.js uh, that's been deprecated, that has a remote code execution exploit. It'll find that and show that to you. Um, so this is a good place to start. 
But I highly recommend starting from the smallest base image possible and building from scratch, you know, building your packages that you need uh, manually instead of trying to rely on other people's uh, base images. Now, other people's images are great to get started, but again, uh, using small base images and using their own base images that you trust is very important. And another reason to use these small base images is just overhead, right? So let's look at a typical Node.js app. Let's say your app is about five megabytes of code. You have about 95 megabytes of dependencies because it's Node.js. And so you have about 100 megs of, quote unquote, your application. Now, let's look at these Docker base images. If you just use the Node 8 off-the-shelf image, it's almost 667 megabytes of stuff. Uh, all the way down to Alpine, which is just 63 megabytes, right? That's a huge difference. In fact, if you look at the base image versus your app, it's about 6.6 .6 times your app size, and it's about 13 times the minimum overhead possible with Alpine. So that's kind of crazy. Um, and so what are the, the pros and cons? So pros, you know, a ton of pros. Builds are faster with smaller images, needs less storage. Uh, cold starts are much faster. So when your application starts for the first time, it has to pull that whole Docker container down. Obviously, it's going to be 13 times faster. And potentially, there's less attack surface, which with less packages and less things inside your container. If someone does get uh, access to your container, there's less things they can do to attack you. Now, of course, there are cons. There are less tooling inside the container. And of course, it's not a standard environment. Something like Debian versus Alpine, there are differences that you have to take into account. But for 99% of use cases out there, using the small Alpine images is just better. So I highly recommend doing that. The next thing that is really cool, and I don't see too many people doing yet, but I see more and more people doing as time goes on, is using something called the builder pattern. Now, this really is useful for static apps, like, uh, sorry, statically compiled apps like Go or C++, things like that, that compile. Uh, and it looks something like this, right? So you take a code, you have a build container that maybe has a compiler, dev dependencies, unit tests, things like that. It runs through all that stuff. Then it takes your static artifacts, uh, your build artifacts, like binary static files, bundles, maybe transpiled code, things like that. And then it takes just those artifacts and then bundles it into a runtime container. And so this just has a runtime environment and maybe some monitoring tools as well. And the nice thing is you know, Docker brings native support for this in Docker CE 17.05, which is a few versions old at this point. So if you're using the latest and greatest version of Docker, you can do this natively without a lot of scripting. And it looks something like this. So in this case, I'm building a Go application and you can see I'm using um, Golang Alpine as the build environment, then I'm building my app, uh, and then I'm taking that static binary uh, and then just copying into a standard Alpine environment. So I don't have the Go uh, compiler and runtime and Go path and all that stuff. I don't have any of that in my production container. All I have is Alpine with one single binary, which is my compiled Go application. And so, Again, anytime you're doing any sort of compiling, this makes a lot of sense. So you say you have TypeScript and you're compiling it into Node.js, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Go, Rust, whatever. So highly recommend using this pattern. Again, removes the surface area for attack and makes smaller containers, which is great. Okay, so those are some quick things on building containers. Now I'm talking about what's actually inside your container, which I feel is a little bit more important. So one important thing, very important, is to use a non-root user inside your container. And so how this looks like is, let's say I'm using, um, again, a Node.js app. I do my app get update, and I install some you know, dependencies like image magic, and I need to do that as root. And once it's done, I'll create a Node.js user, and then uh, do everything else as that Node.js user. I don't need to be root inside the container. Now you might wonder, you know, why is that important? Uh, isn't the container kind of isolated from the main system? Well, if for whatever reason, someone is able to hack into your container and then do a container escape and get into your host, they will be root in your host. Now, if you do this, now there'll be Node.js inside your host and they have to do another exploit 
to get root access. So it's just another barrier, another line of a defense uh, against any potential attacks, right? So yeah, maybe having root inside a container is not useful, but if they ever break out of the container, you want to have as many you know, shells around your infrastructure as possible. So it's just a best practice. Uh, and the nice thing about Kubernetes is you can actually enforce this. So you can have something called a security context and in the security context, there's a lot of options, and one of them is run as non-root. And if you set this to true, it won't let any container execute as root. So in this case, if we didn't do um, user node.js, uh, it will just not let you run this container. It'll say you are root, you can't run. So that's really nice. So Kubernetes can enforce this it's a policy-wide for your whole uh, cluster, so developers can't do it wrong. The next thing I highly recommend is to make the file system read only. And again, Kubernetes can enforce this uh, with another security context option, read only root file system true. And a good reason to do this is just, again, for more layers of security. Uh, writing to the file system can often lead to security vulnerabilities. Uh, let's say someone rewrites a, a file and all of a sudden your PHP code is starting to execute something completely different or you have a SQL exploit that lets you rewrite some sort of file, uh, things like that. So when you have a read-only file system, basically you're more static, right? Someone can't go and modify your code if they get um, access to your container. And again, chances are maybe this won't happen, but there's a lot of bugs out there. There's a lot of exploits out there in the wild, zero days, things like that. The more layers of security you have, the better it is. And again, Kubernetes lets you enforce these things uh, at a system level, so you don't have to, you don't worry about shooting yourself in the foot. The next thing uh, is a good practice, uh, is one process per container. And so what I mean by this is, uh, you can run more, multiple processes in a container, um, but it's highly recommended to just run one. And the reason why is Kubernetes and other container orchestrators, you know, they, they do help checks and things like that. And the way they operate is, by default, if the process is running, it's healthy. And if the process is stopped, it's unhealthy. Now, if you have 20 processes running in a container, well, which one is what, right? If a process stops, is it still healthy? Is it not healthy? Uh, and you have zombie processes running you know, under the covers, even though the container is technically stopped. It gets really complicated and very confusing. Instead, I highly recommend running one process per container. And then if you do need to run multiple processes that need to talk together, Using, uh, using the pod concept to run multiple containers, each one running one, one process, and then using a pod to run them all together. Uh, another one is don't restart on failure. And this kind of ties into the run one process thing, right? So what I mean by this is for a lot of you know, traditional systems that run on VMs, uh, use something like PM2 or Nodemon or some sort of watcher process you can tell them from the Node.js world, but any sort of thing that kind of watches your process and if it crashes, it'll restart it, right? And this is important for high uptime. If a process crashes, uh, it's nice if the computer can automatically restart the process so you don't have downtime. Now, in a Kubernetes world, Kubernetes will actually restart the container for you, so you don't have to do this. It's instead very important that you clean, uh, uh, not clean, uh, crash cleanly instead, and so, this means that you, you know, clean up everything you can and then crash with a error code. Now, Kubernetes will detect that your process has crashed. And the important thing is it'll update your logs and things like that with, hey, this process has crashed, or maybe it's crashing a lot for some reason. Maybe the node has failed, things like that, right? So you want Kubernetes to kind of handle the crashing of your application and make, let it do the decisions of when to restart and rerun your application on maybe a different VM or just restart it there, things like that. And if you are you know, catching these uh, errors and then restarting your application and not letting Kubernetes know, then these errors will bu bubble up to your developers. So it's important to let Kubernetes handle failure. And another very simple one is to log everything to standard out and standard error. By default, uh, Kubernetes will listen to these pipes and again, send it to your logging service. So on Google Cloud, for example, uh, standard out and standard error go to stack driver logging automatically. So you don't have to sort of, you know, tool your own logging systems, just log everything with standard out and standard error, best practice. 
Now, this is no longer the case in modern versions of Kubernetes, uh, but if you're running an older version of Kubernetes, it's a good idea to add something called a dump in it to prevent zombie processes. And so here's how you do it. Yelp has a dump in it thing that they invented that you can just kind of add into your container, and you run that as your entry point instead of the raw command. And so what this does, again, not necessary on newer versions of Kubernetes, again, in 1.7, 1.8, not necessary anymore. But again, what this does is it allows your process to be able to handle um, uh, Linux kernel events like SIGTERM, SIGHUP, things like that. Normally, your Node.js process or your Go app or Ruby app doesn't know how to handle these um, interrupts. And so it'll just do weird things. And so if you have an init system like system D or dumb init or whatever, it'll able, it's able to handle these, um, these signals. And you know, running a full init system like system D is very heavy, so that's why you use dumb init. But in 1.7, uh, Kubernetes will take care of these signals for you, basically. Uh, it'll do reaping of processes that are you know, in a weird state. So you don't have to do this anymore. But if you're running an old version of Kubernetes, which I know a lot of people are, still a best practice to use a dominant system. Or a full init system like systemd if you're OK with the overhead. Now let's move on to deployment. So we built our container. We've kind of made our container internals nice and good. So now let's actually deploy these containers onto our systems. So one option is to use the, rec rec the record option or record um, option for easier rollbacks. Um, so in this case, I just do a dash dash record uh, when I do my uh, deployment. And so what this will do is every time there's an update to my deployment, it'll actually give me what caused that change, right? So in the first one, I basically did the apply with the deployment.yaml. And then in my second one, I edit, I did edit. And so I know what I did there. And then the third one, I did a set image and I changed the image to app2.o, right? So the nice thing is I can roll back to revision one, two, or three at any time. And if I didn't give the record flag, basically I could still roll back, but I just wouldn't have the change cause uh, recorded. That's the only difference. Again, it does take a little bit of storage space, uh, but it's trivial, trivially small. So again, I recommend using the record flag uh, for production deployments. The next thing is to use plenty of descriptive labels. This is actually one thing I don't see a lot of people using very often, especially when they're starting out. Uh, when you start getting into more production scenarios, that's when I start seeing people use more and more labels. And labels are really powerful things in Kubernetes. Uh, so here's an example of a label. You know, so I'm saying this deployment has a label name, web, color, blue, experimental, true. Uh, and you might notice that experimental true is in quotes That's because true is a Boolean value and I want a string, so I put it in quotes. Um, yay for YAML. Now, what can I do with these, these labels? Again, they're arbitrary key value pairs. So you can do whatever you want for your system. Uh, in this case, let's say I have four containers. Uh, they are all part of the app Nifty. Some of them have different phases and some of them have different roles. So let's say I want to select all containers called with the, that you know, are part of the app Nifty. Well, I can do that with just app equals Nifty. Let's say I want to select all backend containers. Well, I can do that with role backend. Let's say I want to select the dev containers. Again, I can do that with uh, the phase dev. Or let's say I want to select the front end containers that are also a phase dev. Now, again, it's just selecting one container, not all three, because it's your additive. So I can kind of cut and slice my containers in any sort of way I want by using labels. And any sort of system that builds on top of Kubernetes usually leverages labels pretty heavily uh, for reporting, for monitoring, for uh, deployment, for anything, what have you. Uh, and services use labels for load balancing, things like that. So again, I highly recommend using as many descriptive labels as you find necessary. Now, sidecars. So sidecars, like I said before, so pods can contain one or more containers. Again, if you're running multiple processes, I recommend using multiple containers in a pod. Uh, 
And so one good reason to run another process is something called a sidecar. So let's say you want a proxy or a watcher or something like that, a, another process that helps the main process do its job. Uh, in the Kubernetes land, we call these sidecars, and they look something like this. So let's say that we have a, a database, um, maybe the database is off, off cluster, right? It's running somewhere else. Now, it kind of sucks if you have to hard code your database credentials and database location into all of your apps. Instead, you can deploy a proxy. Uh, for example, the Google Cloud SQL proxy acts like this, and you deploy it as a sidecar for your app. So now your app just talks to uh, a standard port over localhost uh, with maybe no, no credentials, it's just you know, a raw connection, and the proxy takes care of the secure connection to the remote database. And so this makes your app development so much easier because when you're running locally, you can just connect to a local database instance for testing, and when you deploy it, it looks the same. You're still connecting to a quote unquote local database over a local host, but the proxy is doing the connection to the remote database. And the other way around also comes into place, right? So maybe incoming requests to your application go through a, pro a proxy that can do auth and rate limiting and you know, retry logic and things like that. And your app doesn't have to implement all of this complicated um, logic for your microservices. Instead, a proxy can do it for you. And so these are both very good use cases for sidecars. Um, but one thing I don't recommend is using sidecars for bootstrapping. Uh, in the past, this was the only option, but nowadays we have something called init containers, which are really cool. Um, so in this case, I have a very uh, sample init container. Basically what it does is it runs BusyBox and it does NS lookup and it basically waits for your downstream dependencies to be up and running, right? So let's say that your app depends on two different microservices, a my app and my DB. Basically this will wait until both of those are up and running before starting your container. And this will prevent a lot of errors and things like that. So again, if you need to do some sort of bootstrapping phase, uh, I highly recommend using init containers. If you need to do something that you know, constantly does some sort of loop and watches your process for changes, then I would use a sidecar container. So for proxies or for things that you know, auto configure depending on network status, things like that, then you can use a sidecar. So depend, sometimes use init containers for one-time things, use sidecars for things that always happen. This one is uh, pretty obvious. I think most people are doing this today. Uh, don't use the latest tag or no tag. Um, what this kind of means is by default, if you don't give a tag for your container, it'll basically try to pull the latest one from the container registry. So Docker Hub, GCR, Quay, whatever. The problem with this is it won't know what the latest is once it starts caching it on the node. So once it pulls it down and it's cached on the VM, the Docker in, in, uh, image is cached. Well, uh, how does it know that the new one has been uh, updated? If you use a very specific tag, I re really recommend using a git hash, for example. Then every time you have an update to your Docker container, you just change that tag and it'll pull the latest one down. There's no question about, you know, is it running the latest or old version? It's running that exact specific version. So again, most people are already doing this. They're not doing this uh, bad practice. They're doing the right thing. So I'm not too worried about that. Now, this is something that most people aren't doing are using readiness and liveness probes. And readiness and liveness probe basically give Kubernetes more insight into your application so it knows if it's healthy, it knows if it should you know, start serving traffic to it, things like that. Again, by default, Kubernetes just says process running, process not running. If the process is running, it's healthy. Process is not running, it's unhealthy. Now, obviously, that's a very naive look at you know, uh, applications, modern applications. So readiness and liveness probes let you specify very specifically if, you, if your application is healthy, if it's ready to start serving traffic and things like that. So I really recommend you know, defining these probes uh, and it's not very difficult, right? So readiness probes are basically, is the app ready to start serving traffic? Um, I think this is required for any production application, right? Otherwise, you know, you might have like a big Java app that needs to do a lot of, comp, uh, you know, booting up the JVM is taking a while and Kubernetes starts serving it traffic when it's not ready yet. 
Uh, with the readiness probe, is it ready? Yes, it is. Then it starts getting traffic. Now, liveness probes are basically like, is it still healthy? Uh, maybe your application has a memory leak and eventually it starts going out of sync, right? Now, if you have a liveness probe that says, you know, you have to return this answer within 10 milliseconds and it starts getting slower and slower and slower, eventually the liveness probe will fail and Kubernetes will uh, reschedule, restart that, it'll kill that container and restart it somewhere else. Again, I think these are really good to define. Maybe it's not 100% necessary for your application, but I think it's a really great thing to define, um, especially for production applications. Now, sometimes it can be the same endpoint, but sometimes they're different. It depends on your application. Now let's move on to services. So we have talked about containers, uh, what's inside of them, how to build them, and then deploying them. Now, services are another very important part about Kubernetes. So one thing I see is when people want to expose a service to the internet, they use type load balancer. Now on Google Cloud, on AWS, on Azure, on these cloud platforms, this will spin up a cloud load balancer, which is really cool. You know, you get all that high availability and you know, uh, high performance from your cloud provider, but it does cost some money. Um, you know, you had to run that load balancer. So let's look at some alternatives to that. So one is ingress. Now on Google Cloud, Ingress will spin up a L7 load balancer. On AWS, I think it'll spin up a application load balancer, I'm not sure. But it's awesome because it lets you load balance multiple services through one endpoint, right? So you have one load balancer that can do smart uh, traffic routing, depending on things like subdomains or path, or things like that, and it can send traffic to the appropriate backend service through one single endpoint. So you, one, pay less money, and two, have a lot simpler setup. You don't have multiple IP addresses that you have to do DNS load balancing with. Instead, you have you know, one load balancer that can map to multiple backend services. Now, of course, this only works for things that are on the HTTP level, right, L7. So if you're doing TCP or UDP stuff, this won't work, but most people are doing you know, web stuff, and this works perfectly for that. Now, another thing that I've seen some people recommend, and I actually recommend it, um, not everyone at Google recommends this, this is more of a personal opinion, I think type node port can be good enough. And what node port does is it exposes your service on VM on a, on a, on a port, right? So maybe port 80 or port 10,000, whatever. Um, the problem with this is it's not as highly available because you know if that VM goes down, uh, you lose access to your whole service, right? Versus a load balancer, which is more uh, highly available. But if you're just running a service that doesn't need that high availability, but you want lower cost, node port can be a great compromise. And again, uh, if you're on a cloud platform like Google or Amazon, things like this, use static IPs, um, they are free. Uh, if it started there because you know, if you're running on-prem, then maybe they're not free, but I highly recommend for any sort of load balancer that you're using, VMs that you're using, you know, use a static IP for it. Don't just use a, um, a firmware IP. And so on Google Cloud, this is really easy to do. Uh, for Ingress, you can create global IPs. Um, for uh, load balance, uh, type load balancers, you can use regional IPs. And for, again, for the load balancer, you can just put in that IP address in the load balancer IP. And then for our ingress, you can just give it a global static IP name. Uh, and for this case, I said I call it ingress, so I call it ingress here. And so what this will do is whenever you spin up that service, maybe you accidentally destroy the service. When you spin it up again, it'll have the same IP address. So you don't have to you know, change your DNS settings or things like that. Um, instead, you have this hard-coded IP, which is much nicer. The next thing I recommend is mapping external services to internal ones. And this is something that most people don't know you can do in Kubernetes. So let's pretend you have a hosted database. Um, let's say it's my.database.example.com. Uh, basically, you can do something called an external name service. And so this will create a Kubernetes service that looks just like a normal Kubernetes service, but it basically does a um, CNAME redirect to the external uh, name, 
And so your internal services can just use the my database name, but it'll basically redirect them to my.database.example.com. So you don't have to know about where the database exactly lives as an application developer. Instead, the Kubernetes cluster manager can kind of just put in this service, and so you don't have to worry about it. And if you don't have a you know, valid uh, DNS name, if you just have an IP address, then you can actually create a endpoint uh, that basically has a list of IP addresses. In this case, I just have one, 10.128.0.2 with a port. And our service can basically send traffic to that list of IP addresses. And this is actually what Kubernetes is doing under the covers. It's creating that endpoint for you when you create a service. With this, you basically do it manually, and you just give it those IP addresses manually. Um, so again, your applications don't have to care about those IP addresses. They just connect to the My Database service, and the service does the load balancing and the rerouting to the actual IP address. So again, you don't hard code you know, things into your application. Uh, let's look at application architecture quickly. Uh, I highly recommend using Helm charts. A uh, Helm is basically like a repository for pre-made Kubernetes configurations, right? So let's say you want to deploy MongoDB. Well, there's a Helm chart for MongoDB. You say Helm deploy MongoDB, and it'll deploy MongoDB to your cluster. Maybe you want um, Redis. Maybe you want some sort of logging, like an Elk stack, things like that. People have already done the work for you, so you can just take their charts, maybe tweak it a little bit, and then deploy it into your own cluster. Which is really nice, saves you a lot of time uh, and effort. You should also, as an application developer, just assume that all your downstream dependencies are unreliable, right? Maybe someone forgot to update their microservice. Maybe someone forgot to actually deploy their microservice. You should always depend that any service that your service depends on is going to be unreliable. And so your application shouldn't just start crashing. It should maybe return an error message, maybe you should have some retry logic, things like that. Um, and I was talking about these retry logic auth, rate limiting, things like that. Um, well, let me go through that first. So one thing that can help with all these things is something called a service mesh. And so a service mesh, uh, maybe like Istio or Linkerd, um, what these do is they kind of do all that for you. They do the downstream management, they do the uh, rate limiting, service discovery, they do all that kind of load balancing, all the stuff that your microservices really need, uh, they do it for you. And I was, I was playing with Istio recently, and the really cool thing is it kind of just injects into your, automatically into your containers. You don't really have to modify your code a lot to take advantage of these things. It does monitoring, it does rate limiting, auth, uh, all automatically, and you just kind of have to just inject it into your container cluster and you're good to go. And I also recommend using something like Weave Scope. Uh, to kind of visualize these things because they don't really have GUIs. So using something like Weave Cloud or Weave, Weave, Weave Scope really helps you know, visualize your Istio and Linkerd deployments. Uh, going back one second, uh, making sure your microservices aren't too micro. You know, people get very excited about microservices and they turn every single little function into its own service. It's probably overkill. You want to break your application into logical components uh, that make sense. So make sure they're not too small or too big. Finally, one thing I tell a lot of people to consider is, you know, maybe you want to use a PaaS, uh, a platform as a service. Maybe Kubernetes is just too low level, has too many knobs for you. You don't want to mess with it. You just want to write your code and hit deploy and, you know, you know deploy your code to production. You don't want to think about all these complicated things that I talked about. So there's a bunch of PaaS that are built on top of Kubernetes, like Deus, OpenShift, Kel, there's a ton more. Uh, just pick one that makes sense and use it. The nice thing is you can always, you know, go down into the lower levels of Kubernetes when you need to, but, you know, nine out of ten times your application developers just want a PaaS that's easy to use that lets you deploy their code. Now, finally, cluster management, last section. Uh, use Google Container Engine. It's awesome. I work for Google, obviously. Uh, I highly recommend Google Container Engine. You click a button, you get a cluster. You can do really cool things like IP aliasing now, node auto upgrades, node pools, all this kind of complicated uh, VM infrastructure management stuff is just taken care of 100% by Google. Um, so I highly recommend using a you know, out-of-the-box solution like Google Container Engine if you can. Obviously, if you're running on-premise, you can't, 
but you know. Another thing that's very important when you're thinking about system architecture and scheduling your workload are resources, anti-affinity, and scheduling. So you can do things like node affinity. Uh, basically, let's say your container can only run on certain VMs, maybe it has to run in multiple different regions, maybe you have an operating system that you prefer. You can actually set these things as a node affinity in your deployment, and Kubernetes will make sure that your containers only run on certain different um, tags, right? Um, another thing is node taints and tolerations. So let's say you have special hardware like GPU or a TPU. Uh, maybe you have a dedicated host that, you know, one customer runs on this host and they don't want anyone else's workload running on that VM uh, or a bare metal machine. You can do things like taints and tolerations. So basically you can taint a VM saying this is tainted the GPU. I know it's a weird word, but uh, then if your container can tolerate a GPU, it'll be scheduled onto that host. Otherwise, it won't be scheduled there. So a GPU is a special you know, piece of hardware. Uh, I don't want a normal web server. I want my machine learning thing to be scheduled onto that. Uh, so this will give Kubernetes hints onto what to evict, uh, what to put on, um, depending on what kind of special things are on your nodes. And then finally, pod affinity and anti-affinity. This is very important for things like databases or things like that. Maybe you have scheduled things together. Maybe you don't want them to be scheduled onto the same. Uh, so maybe you want your database to be spread over multiple zones for reliability, right? Again, up to you on how you want to schedule your workloads. These, these different things, affinity, node affinity, anti-affinity, taste tolerations, give you the, the ability to kind of give hints to the scheduler uh, on where you should, where you should run your workloads. You should use namespaces to split up your cluster. Uh, this is very obvious. Some people use dev and test. Uh, I kind of recommend using a separate dev cluster and a separate prod cluster and a separate test cluster, you know, separate the clusters completely. But you can use namespaces to split your applications into different places. Uh, you can give them different amounts of RAM and CPU that they're allowed to use. Uh, so basically, you can't have a process or application just goes crazy and just uses all your resources, right? By using namespaces, you can kind of limit the, the damage control, things like that. Uh, Role-based access control, something that I'm not super familiar with, but again, again, limiting the amount of access your applications and your developers have to your cluster, right? That's what role-based access control really does. Finally, just unleash the chaos monkey. Uh, we do this at all the time at Google. Um, just, you know, what happens if you just start deleting VMs from your cluster. I don't know. Will your application be able to survive? Maybe, maybe not. What happens if you just delete a service? Will all your upstream applications just start crashing? I don't know. Go try it out. This is what testing is for, right? So I highly recommend just unleashing that chaos monkey, uh, doing things that will you think might break your system. See what happens. Um, if you want more resources, here's a ton. Uh, again, all these slides are on speaker deck. Uh, speakerdeck.com slash sandlord slash Kubernetes best practices. If you follow me on Twitter at Sunit Dinesh, I actually plan in 2018 to take all of these best practices and then write full blog posts and full videos, deep dive into each and every one. I know I talked about this very quickly in about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, there's a ton of content around this. So follow me on Twitter. Um, and in early 2018, I plan on doing a full series deep diving into a lot of these concepts. So uh, again, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer maybe one or two now, and then maybe we can do it at the, at the very end. So thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let me do a quick switch over. Sorry about that. So I think I see a few questions. Um, unless Jordan wants to go now, and then we can do all the questions later. I'm not sure. Uh, so let's just, I can do a few questions quickly. So one is like, how do you maintain state between restarts? Uh, you should use stateful sets, uh, and the state is stored on a persistent disk. So it's not um, going to be stored on the container. It's going to be stored on a network attached disk of some sort, um, and that's how you do it with stateful sets. What's the best practice to deploy another YAML? Um, I recommend deploying another YAML and then checking your YAMLs into a source control. That's the way I do it. Some people you know, edit the Kubernetes files directly. That's another way to do it. I'm not sure if that's the best way. 
uh, how do you monitor the rollout? Um, this is where something like Istio comes into uh, place or Spinnaker. There's a lot of tooling that's designed to you know, help you with you know, rolling stuff out, things like that. You can do it with kubectl too, but it's a lot less, um, lot less control. Uh, links to recommended proxies, uh, Google Cloud SQL proxy, it's just for us. Uh, there's not too many that I know about off the top of my head. Uh, init containers don't use the annotations in 1.7, 1.8, correct. I was doing this in 1.6, so that's awesome. Uh, makes it much easier to use init containers, which is great. Uh, da -da. Yes, node port surface support on all nodes and routes of active service, exactly. So you can do things like DNS load balancing, but it's not as you know, good as a te technically as a you know, cloud load balancer. So you do have a little bit less uptime. Let's keep going. Do you know which CNI supported network? Calico Weave is most similar to GCP network. I don't know. We are trying to get support for Calico in Google Cloud itself, so you have a little bit more control. But I uh, don't know which is the most similar to the GCP network. Ours is pretty unique. <laughs> uh, GC is great inside uh, Google Cloud, troubleshooting guides. Yeah, I'm not the best expert on outside Google Cloud. There's a lot of tools like again, Chaos, uh, Cube Atom, things like that, which are really help running the outside Google Cloud, outside Azure, things like that. Uh, but I'm not the super expert. Which chaos testing tools do you recommend? I don't, that's a good question. I don't know if there's any tools, um, but you can just do it manually for now. Uh, I'm sure someone, someone has tools, I just haven't found any good ones. Uh, da -da -da -da. Linux Windows clusters, that's pretty hard to do in, in Kubernetes right now as Windows doesn't really have anything but alpha support for Kubernetes. Uh, missed where the slides really sound. Thank you, someone, someone posted the Chaos Cube, awesome. I will post my slides in the chat as well. But just take a time, let's move to Jordan's talk. Sure. Don't worry, no, no rush. We're, we're I'll try to go as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's all right. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to quickly mention to people, um, you know, we checked with the speakers. Sometimes speakers like to take questions in the middle of the talk. Some people prefer at the end. So um, both our speakers today preferred at the end. So thanks for all of your great questions in the chat. Um, if you wanted to follow up or want some more information, we can certainly um, follow up with you. I'll also share our Slack channel at the end. And um, yes, we had a couple of questions about, you know, is this recorded? It is. Yes, it is recorded. And will the slides be shared? And yes, um, we, we will share the slides. So again, thanks for that. And with that, we will switch over to Jordan. OK, so my name is Jordan. I'm a software engineer here at WeaveWorks. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about sort of the just sort of dovetail of the stuff that uh, Sandeep talked about, sort of talked about how we implemented Kubernetes ourselves and some of the lessons learned we had. I'm going to try to talk fast because we're short on time. So I'll try to answer as many questions as I can at the end. So. Uh, just tell you a little bit about our stack and our, our cluster um, and our, give a sense for our scale. Um, so we've got uh, about 72 different deployments spread across 11 namespaces uh, and oh, it's a 13 hosts last I counted and about 150 containers. So that's a pretty standard for a small startup, uh, maybe a little bigger than normal. So that's about where we're at. We've got about 20 engineers, so if that gives any um, context. So. Um, our Kubernetes cluster runs on AWS. Uh, we obviously use EC2 for that. Um, the other interesting part of that is we don't do any persistent storage in the containers themselves, in the application containers. I think that's a big um, a question we get from a lot of users is, what do I do with my state? Um, the answer that we have for that is write it somewhere else, so make it somebody else's problem. Um, so we don't do any sort of things with like mounting volumes and stuff like that. Um, we do use things like memcache heavily, uh, and those are just runs and running containers because that we can lose that data and not, and not you know lose any customer data. Um, so the next question we get is how do I do things locally? Um, there's lots of emulators for AWS services on Docker Hub that you can use. Um, there's uh, S3, I think there's S3 emulators. There's definitely some for Dynamo and RDS uh, if you want to do local development that way and not actually write to your actual AWS uh, cluster. So. Um, so the theme for this talk or this presentation will be the challenges we face in implementing a Kubernetes cluster and sort of how we implemented some best practices that we um, wanted to, some goals that we had. So uh, our first challenge was how do we do version control for infrastructure? So this is something that is really um, difficult to, for a lot of people to sort of uh, to get to, the point to get to. Um, the reason we want to do this is we want infrastructure changes to be reviewed just like 
you know, a pull request uh, approved and rolled back just like application code. So we want our infrastructure config to exist in text files and in a Git repo uh, instead of, you know, click point and clicking in the AWS GUI, for example. So we want to be able to have uh, a record of everything that's changed on our cluster. Um, so I'll just get into like how we accomplish that. Uh, so Kubernetes doesn't give you a lot of the, um, it's, it's sort of, it's further up in the stack. So you need things to create VMs and provision your hosts for you and do those kind of things. So the two tools we use for that are uh, Terraform for, oops, I meant to highlight it. I guess I can't highlight. Uh, Terraform uh, to create VMs and configure uh, AWS stuff. There's uh, plugins for most cloud providers. So if you have like DigitalOcean or Google or whatever, Azure, I'm sure there's plugins for all that stuff too. And they have, uh, you know, API specific things for each of those. Um, makes it really nice to manage IAM roles because it's described in version control in a text file, which is really awesome. Uh, the other thing Terraform has is reusable modules. So if you want to sort of maybe have a module you want to use in your QA instance, in your prod instance, you can, you know, encapsulate that in a module and reuse it a bunch of times. Um, also does item potent updates. So it's, it will, if you run the update more than once, it'll, you'll end up with the same result. It won't, it, it can do the diff essentially. Um, Ansible to configure the hosts. Um, Ansible is what we use the least uh, just because it's, it's sort of just doing the bare minimum uh, of installing things. Uh, Ansible is great because it's uh, agentless, so you can do everything you can do over SSH. You can do, you don't need to run like chef agents or, or anything like that. Um, has a similar workflow to Terraform with the modules and item potent updates. Um, the reason we didn't use Terraform for provisioning hosts is it doesn't really do operating system level uh, changes. So in order to make a change, you'd have to like recreate the VM or something like that. So Ansible for configuring hosts. And then of course, Kubernetes YAML files for application stuff like uh, Sandeep was talking about. Okay, so that's version control, control for infrastructure. So all this stuff lives in a Git repo. Um, we um, have you know the same pull request workflow you do for uh, application changes you can now do for infrastructure stuff. And that'll sort of dovetail into my next piece here, which is um, one problem arises where you can have something different from version control than you do in production. So this is basically just somebody forgetting to apply the configuration. So um, somebody just didn't run kubectl apply or didn't run terraform update or whatever the, um, the command was. And so the solution we came up with, sort of, uh, sort of a solution, is scripts to check the diff between what's running and what's in version control. So in the case of Kubernetes config, you have your uh, YAML files in a repo. You need to sort of download that repo, uh, diff it, and, and sort of report back. And so what we have is something that runs every so often and then reports in Slack and says, hey, you forgot to apply this. This is an example of the Slack alert here. Um, this is, a, we have a, a tool called kubediff that's open source, you can check out. Um, we, we, this is what we run internally. Uh, and uh, you can use it as well. Uh, we also have scripts for Ansible and Terraform, but they're not as interesting, so we don't have them open source. They're just like diffing adjacent blob. Um, okay, so I'll move on to our next, how am I doing on time? I have no idea. Okay. Uh, our next challenge is uh, continuous delivery. So in a Kubernetes environment, um, uh, it gives us the opportunity to sort of do continuous delivery for our containers. So I'll talk about how we do that. Um, so in a manual, in a manual um, way that you, a, a human has to update Kubernetes is, this is kind of how it would work in, in the wild here, is uh, CI, is, this, is my font too small on these? Oh, okay. CI finishes and pushes up a uniquely tagged container image to the registry. I'll talk about the unique tags in a minute. Um, so now you've got a new fresh container uh, image in your container image registry with your new application code. Um, and that sort of represents the next the thing you want to update your Kubernetes config to or your cluster to. So now you, um, since we're using sort of version controlled uh, infrastructure, um, we update our, our Kubernetes YAML file to utilize the new image, right? So we say, you know, the image version is whatever our new image is. And then we apply the update, right, using kubectl. And then you probably commit that change back to version control, um, either via pull request or maybe it's already been committed, but you still have to commit the change. Um, so there's a lot of manual steps that aren't really all that interesting. So what we decided to do 
Oh, hang on. I'm going to do a quick sidetrack on what I mean by uniquely tagged uh, images. So um, I, what I call them is, we, we call them as immutable container images. So uh, what that means is you want to be able to tie a specific code version to your container image. So that's, um, why do you want to do that? So you want to be able to tell which code is running in production. So you need to be able to, you want to be able to look at that image and know exactly what commit it was, it uh, refers to. Um, which is really helpful for debugging. It's like, you know, what what code is actually running in my microservice? It turns into like a way harder question to answer uh, than it needs to be. So um, Kubernetes doesn't understand changes to the latest tag. So this is what I mean by immutability. So if you uh, push up a new container image and it's got the latest tag, you're kind of mutating the latest tag. So you're mutating the image that's the latest. So that's why what I mean by immutable. So in general, I think Sandeep touched on this too, is we don't use the latest tag for anything but local dev work. Um, this also makes it easy to roll back because if you know which code version is was working before, you just go apply that code version. Um, so yeah, so this is a um, an image a image here from our registry or a registry that shows like we have the the branch and then like the short hash uh, of the application code. Um, this is just done with like a make file. Um, there's a, a lengthier blog post on, on this, uh, on our WeaveWorks blog. You can check out that I wrote. Okay, so that's a quick sidetrack on container images. Um, so a lot of users come to us and they have this issue where the, they do like a quick hack to get this to work. And they're easy, there's ways to do this with bash scripts, right? So one short-term solution that people come up with is they add a CI to update your cluster when a new image gets created. So add a step to CI, I should say. So that just means like your Jenkins or whatever will go and like run, maybe run the kubectl command. It'll push up an image and run the kubectl command. Um, it also has to then save that back to version control. If you want to use our our um, our, if, our version control infrastructure, so then you have to like do some cloning and diffing and sort of editing of files in CI, which is kind of clunky and it turns into a rat's nest quickly. Um, so uh, yeah, so what we are, our sort of long-term solution that we came up with is we built an internal tool to, to manual, to do, to automate those manual steps. So we built a tool that will do these things for us, uh, these four steps. Um, it's called Flux. Um, we turn it into a product. So this is a, one of our main products in uh, Weave Cloud is we have a, um, uh, a um, commercial offering of this if you don't want to roll your own uh, or run your own Flux here. So Flux is a command line tool and, uh, and a backend that um, will do this for you. Um, another note on it is the way we actually implement our, our um, way we have it sort of configured is our staging environment gets updated automatically. So as soon as a new container image is uh, pushed up to our registry, uh, our Flux will go in and um, do those four steps and apply it immediately, as fast as it can, you know, immediately, right? So it does the cloning and the, or it does the, um, the editing of the repo and then, you know, applying the config. And then that way staging always matches master. So you can always know which, like when you're about to do uh, a deployment to prod, you know, you can just go look at staging and figure out what's gonna go out. It's always master, it's always automated. Um, so yeah, and that way, if you break staging, uh, it's not a huge deal. So, and then production gets released once a day by our on-call person. So our on-call person is just one of our engineers. We don't really have dedicated DevOps people. So, um, we just have somebody who does it once a day, they do a diff and figure out what's going to go out and then, uh, applies it. So are we on time? Get a little bit of time. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about is learning and monitoring. So monitoring in a microservice environment presents new challenges. Um, so those challenges are, um, you've got more data. Um, so you've got more events because you have more, you know, individual pieces of your application. So you're just going to have more data. So if you're storing that data somewhere, when I say, I mean like metrics and logs and tracing and stuff like that, that's, that's going to cost either time or you're going to have to pay someone to host that data. That's more, it's more of it. So, uh, the other piece is you have a dynamic environment, so you don't always know where your containers are running. And so this presents, um, some issues where um, you don't necessarily know which host your container is running on. And this, in general, you just have more moving parts because you're doing microservices and you have more, um, you know, the network can fail in new and interesting ways. So um, 
Uh, how we do it is we use Prometheus for metrics and learning. Um, so Prometheus is a time series database with a sort of a, a bent on, on being a great monitoring solution. Um, so some features and sort of um, key points for Prometheus is uh, it's got service discovery for Kubernetes. So you can uh, just sort of run your Prometheus client and it will sort of figure out all the different services it needs to It'll ask Kubernetes and Kubernetes will tell you, here's where you need to go to scrape your metrics. Um, the other thing it does is it's uh, really heavy on doing really efficient compression. So it, it's, it's really um, efficient when it comes to storing time series data. So you can store a lot of data in a, in a obviously in a small space, which is great for microservices because you can have, like I said before, a lot of data. Uh, it also does pull versus push. So Traditionally, in monitoring, you can either push metrics to or state to a to an aggregator, or you can pull it from the individual services. Um, the problem with push is that the thing that's sort of handling all the incoming requests has to be able to throttle and handle a bunch of data, and you might lose data if it has to sort of drop requests just to keep up with all the um, load. So pull is 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 better is what Prometheus um, you know professes. And so what that can do is this person scraping can, or the Prometheus can sort of scrape at its own pace and sort of handle data as it, um, uh, that it can, uh, it can go at its own pace and not have to get overloaded. Um, but also you get uptime, the uptime metric as a side effect with pull. So you can just say, if my pull failed, my request failed, I know that service is probably down or have an idea that that service is probably down. So uptime for free or as a side effect, I should say. Um, for me, this has a lot of client libraries for whatever language and framework you're using. So if you use, we're using Go, Node.js, um, C Sharp, all that stuff, you've got lots of client libraries for that. So you don't need to, um, uh, and it's all open source. So that's good. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is we use Grafana for visualization. Uh, so Grafana is just a nice UI for graphs. Um, and we also built a Python library to uh, help build those charts and graphs easier. So um, a lot of people are probably using Grafana. I just want to let everybody know we have a, a cool Python DSL uh, for editing Grafana JSON. So JSON is, so what the Python um, DSL lets you do is obviously you can do branching and looping and all that fun stuff and it will render some JSON that will work with Grafana for you. So. Um, I believe that's it. So um, we have one. How do you deal with the HA for Kubernetes on AWS? Uh, okay, are you, okay, we're good. Uh, so HA, I think what we do is, I think, believe we have a, a ELB, so Elastic Load Balancer, uh, for that sits in front of Kubernetes. Um, does that, that answer the question? Let's go for the question. It's a, a dealing with HA with uh, Kubernetes on AWS. What's our? Um, um, so that's that's kind of the answer. Okay. Is we have the EOB in front of it, and then we have like thirteen nodes that everything's sort of balanced across. Okay. So I believe that's. I had to go look it up in the exact implementation. So. Okay. Um, have you seen any issues with the private topology in DNS? That's different from the CNI network type. So he's experienced some bugs coming from Anthony. I'm worried we're echoing. I just need to look at the question. Can you tell me the name of the person? Uh, Anthony, this is the like the most recent, the most recent questions at the bottom of the list. Oh, I'm actually going from going bottom top. Okay, got it. Uh, okay, private topology DNS. Uh, don't so we're not using a CNI network for our networking. We get a lot of questions about networking. I sort of deliberately avoided it because it's not really my forte. So um, we're using like a static route table that Terraform implement, uh, manages. So we go in like, when we add a new host, it will um, it will just go make a, a static route for it. I have to go look at the exact implementation. Okay. So I don't have an answer for your question. Anthony. All right, we can yeah. follow up with your email. Um, and another one, uh, my question, how do you expand your Kubernetes cluster in AWS? to more than 100 nodes, with the current routing table limit being around 100 entries. Uh, I'll let you know when we get there. <laughs> We're at 13 right now. So. Yeah, we are starting. Um, I believe our, we have some like, um, yeah, we're, in, we're fairly small, so we've got a yeah, single uh, availability zone, and we haven't got to that scale yet. All right. So, yeah. um, and then, so now I'm scrolling up from the bottom here. 
Rajan is asking, if we have monitoring solutions already, can we integrate, for example, Elk Genios? Um, so, what game are I coming? I kind of, let me just read the question. <laughs> can you view it as I'm asking? Sorry. Sure. Look at me, hearing my own voice words me out. Okay, uh, so monitoring solutions already. So Elk, I'm not familiar with Elk. So um, Prometheus, the way you work with Prometheus is you sort of instrument your application with sort of like, let's say you're, like for us, it's a, like if it's a Node.js app, for example, you have a middleware that will, will sort of um, be able to uh, gather a bunch of metrics and then exposes the metrics endpoint to be scraped. So I don't if, if Elk is a is sort of a I'm not sure on the integration levels there I'm not sure if that's if Elk is sort of a I think it's a logging platform if I'm not mistaken so sorry uh, Rajan I don't have a good answer for your, for your question there turn on my mic for one second from Sudeep um, can you talk about the storage needed for the Prometheus time series data what if there is a security requirement to keep the metrics for 180 days. Great question. So Prometheus will, I believe there's a retention policy you can set. So I can't, the, the data, as far as the amount of storage you're going to need, uh, I can't speak to that exactly. I know it's that one of the sort of the goals of the project for Prometheus is to have it be very efficient at storing uh, data. So I think somebody, I think somebody mentioned in here uh, that uh, Prometheus is good at short term, short term. You can do things like a federated uh, Prometheus uh, cluster, which will um, you sort of downsample as you go, if that's your use case. Um, there's been some really interesting work on the federated, um, uh, you know, use case for Prometheus, where you sort of chain them together. Uh, the other option is to use Leap Cloud. So we offer a Prometheus as a service as part of our product. So because a lot of people have the same uh, requirements. So our our current um, SLAs will store your Prometheus data for 13 months. So uh, we've got a project called Cortex that you can check out. That's a uh, an HA Prometheus, um, and it is IPI compliant with Prometheus, but it's horizontally scalable. So we host uh, that as part of Leap Cloud. So, um, awesome. Uh, and then we have: Do you use self-hosted Kubernetes or System D? Self-hosted for System D. Self-hosted Kubernetes or System D. Uh, we use uh, self-hosted, I think, is the, I don't think we're using systemd heavily, so it's just running on AWS. Um, we've got some scripts that sort of spin things up, and we use uh, kubeadmin, Kubernetes components running as containers versus, ad oh, I think, okay, so kubelet, things like that. Um, so I believe those are sort of, uh, I don't think those are systemd. I think we just sort of, uh, Ansible just installs those and tells them to run, I think is how that works. I think I'll follow up on that. Yes. Um, I think this might be the last one. Do you use COPS to spin up clusters on AWS, or how do you deal with TLS certificates and ingress? Good question. Um, so TLS certificates, I think, so there's a piece of that that's, uh, I know Ansible is responsible for copying things back and forth. Uh, I'd have to go look up exactly how we do uh, certs. Um, I know, I, I don't know to what extent we use Kubernetes secrets. Uh, I know I've used them a little bit. I don't know as far as TLS stuff goes. I should also probably mention that we're sort of uh, running inside of a, uh, a uh, AWS VPC. So the networking, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, I don't know if we're using TLS within, I guess we are. Yeah, so we're using a little bit of that stuff internally but for internal services, so I'd have to go look up. I think Ansible is responsible for copying those around, and maybe we might store those certs in, in AWS. Hopefully that answered your question. Sorry. Okay, excellent. So with that, um, I'm turning on my mic. <laughs> um, thank you to Sandeep, and thank you to Jordan for this talk, and thanks to all of you not only for um, coming and your great questions, but I see a lot of conversations between you sharing ideas. So um, I will be following up with you. If, you, um, if we haven't addressed all of yours, um, we'll be following up with our link to join our Slack channel. So definitely please join us and our developer experience team. We are here to help you. And we look forward to chatting with you more. So thank you again, and I'll see you. Bye-bye.